In this fifth and final item on the exam, we've got a rigid bar ABCD, two hangers, a five kip load, the total length of this uh, rigid bar, which is representing a balcony beam, is it is 17 feet long, right? And we're asked to find the axial stress in rod two. We're going to assume elastic behavior. That sure, certainly simplifies some of our, our modeling. The rod number one is aluminum, rod number two is steel. In real practice, this would be a little unusual to have different um, materials in the hanger rods. It's also unlikely that we would have different diameters. So this is a little bit of an academic uh, problem. Each one of the hanger rods is 10 feet long. So the geometry of the situation is actually relatively reasonable. Um, the details are perhaps maybe not so practical. The only thing that would have to do to make it practical, of course, is just change the materials to, to those that you more, might more commonly um, be using. Right, so we've got a five kip load out here at the tip of the beam. And the rod at C will be pulling back. Let's just call that for C. The rod at B would also be uh, pulling back and then we'll have reactions at A, it's a pin reaction, so an X and a Y uh, component here to play with. Our equilibrium equation would be probably the way we want to do this. Oh no, one, two, three, four unknowns. So this tells me we have a statically indeterminate system because one, two, three, four independent forces and I don't. I only have three equations of equilibrium for this non-concurrent two-dimensional problem. So it is going to be statically indeterminate. Let's get rid of these two right off the bat. We can sum moments about point A. Let's take counterclockwise positive, and we'll have five feet times B plus twelve feet times C minus then seventeen feet times the five kip load. Set it equal to zero. Note that if we divide through by 5 here, then we'll get that B plus 2.4 times C, because that's 12 divided by 5, minus 17, or well, equal 17. The 5's cancel out, take the 17 to the other side. And that will be important and useful for us in just a bit. The displacements, then, we can go take a look at. Note that uh, the displacement diagram is such that we can see that delta D would equal by similar triangles 17 over 5 times delta B. Don't know that we need it, but it comes from our diagram. And delta C will equal 12 over 5 times delta B. That's ratio we know is 2.4 times delta B. And it is this one that we actually are going to mostly focus on because that gives us the compatibility equation that we really ultimately are going to, to need. Right now, we, we're going to get there to that additional equation by looking at our force displacement relationship. That would be the axial force displacement relationship. And so we know that generically that's delta equals P L over AE. So for instance, for number one, delta one is going to be equal to the axial force B times its length of 10 feet divided by its area, which is pi over 4 times the diameter squared. That's NL over A, and we need the E in here, so 10,000 times 200 KSI. This be inches squared, of course. Right? And then we've got del for the second one, and that's going to be C times also 10 feet over pi over 4 times 0.5 inches squared. And the E that we have here is 29,000 KSI. Right now that looks kind of messy here, and we could work out some numbers, but note something else here. Your displacement at B is going to be equal to your axial deformation at 1 of rod 1. And the axial displacement at C is going to be exactly equal to the deformation of the second one. And since we know 
that delta C is e equal to 2.4 delta B, which is little delta 1, notice here what we really are going to do is say, hey, this whole thing times 2.4 has to be set equal to delta, that delta 2 is, uh, let me get this right, delta 2 equals 2.4 times delta 1. Right, so I'm going to take this whole thing, that's a flippy floppy, right, that's this guy here. Delta 1 is this guy, right, 2.4 times delta 1, and so that goes away, that goes away, that goes away. That just sort of simplifies this calculation. If you don't like that little daring do, then just ignore it, just do your own thing. But what you're going to get out of this is ultimately when you solve, you'll find out that B is equal to 0 0.3297 times C. We can substitute that in to our equation that we got from equilibrium, right? And that will tell us that we have 2.7297C equals 17. So therefore, C is going to be equal to 6.23 kips. Right? That just gives us the C value, and the C value only, which is all we need, because to get the axial stress, then sigma in number 2 will equal the force C over the area, or our 6.23 kips over our pi times 0.5 inches quantity squared over 4. So that's the same thing as a 16. So 16 times 6.23 divided by pi. And you get a stress in tension of 31.7 KSI get a tension. Now, if you, by the way, if this is steel and it's A36 steel, then we probably encroached upon the, well, not probably, we will have encroached upon the factor of safety of real practice, but that is less than the yield. So at least we've abided by elastic behavior that we was a part of our initial assumption. We don't need to calculate the aluminum uh, force nor its stress, but if we were going to Sigma 1 would be equal to the B value. The B value, when you plug back in, is going to be equal to 2.048. And now we'd be dividing by a different diameter. And there, let's just see what that might look like. Uh, that would be 2.048 divided by pi times 4 divided by 0.75 squared and that would equal 4.64 KSI, also in tension. And in both cases, that would be less than the typical yield stress for each of the materials. May have encroached upon factors of safety in the steel case, um, probably would not have for the, um, the aluminum. We weren't asked to do the latter. The answer here is that one alone.